next video we are going to learn about free will's algorithm free will's algorithm what is it about what makes it unique is it fast and is it always correct so let's find out let's start by talking about matrix multiplication first we all know how matrix multiplication works so let's take two matrices of size 2 by 2 and we want to multiply them how do we do it? We take each element of a row and multiply that with each element of a column. So we have n squared elements here where n is equal to 2 and each of these n squared element get multiplied n times. So if you see here a gets multiplied 2 times and so it is with the rest of the other elements. So in total each of the n squared element of the first matrix undergoes n multiplications with the second matrix. So in total n cubed multiplications. So if you were to write a straightforward deterministic algorithm it would run in O of n cubed time which is a pretty high complexity. Let's take a look at the history of matrix multiplication algorithms. Over the past few decades, scientists and mathematicians were able to come up with some fast algorithms that could run in subcubic time. By subcubic, we mean less than order of n cubed. So in 1969, Volker Strassen was the first person to come up with an algorithm that could run in O of n to the power 2.807 time and over the next few decades more algorithms have emerged and the current fastest algorithm is one which was developed by Alman and Williams in 2012 that runs in O of n to the power 2.3729 so we really haven't achieved an algorithm that could run in O of n squared time and it is still an open question uh, how fast can you theoretically compute the product of two matrices and that is still an open question in the field of computer science along with a ton of other open questions so we move on now to the topic of focus for this video which is matrix product verification so given three matrices we want to verify that one of them is the product of the other two or more formally given three n by n matrices a b and c verify whether a times b is equal to c and the problem statement we want to frame is is there a faster way to perform the above verification faster than o of n cubed or o of n to the power 2.3729 which is the current fastest algorithm so we introduce free will's algorithm so what is it uh, it is a randomized probabilistic algorithm that performs matrix product verification in O of n squared time with a high probability of correctness and it is not a deterministic algorithm which means it does not always give us the correct answer so you might ask why even use an algorithm that isn't always correct or we could ask if it is not always correct then how often is it not correct or in more technical terms what is the error probability and it turns out interestingly that the error probability could be reduced to a very small value when you simply run the algorithm more number of times so what we have essentially now is a very fast algorithm which is not always correct but is correct most of the time or in other words the rate of being wrong is extremely small so let's take a look at the steps of the algorithm. So first we generate uh, n by 1 random vector r 
Now r can have values only 0 or 1 and the dimension of r is n. Next we compute this vector p as a times br minus cr and finally we check if p is a 0 vector we say yes a times b is in fact c and if p is non-zero a b is not equal to c. Now I want you to notice two things here. First this expression is essentially another way of checking uh, for equality like how do we say if two things are equal? Well we check if the difference is zero and another thing is b here is a n by n matrix and r is an n by 1 matrix and this operation BR essentially reduces the number of matrix multiplication to n squared. So this is part of the reason why this algorithm is fast. So let's look at an example where we will try to apply free will's algorithm to verify matrix multiplication and we're going to run the algorithm for two trials and see the results. So we have three matrices A, B and C and we want to check if A times B equals C. So first we select a random 2 by 1 vector R as 1, 1 out of four possible vectors. We compute P as A times BR minus CR and the result we get is a zero vector. Now as for the algorithm, this seems to suggest that AB equals to C when in fact it's not. And the actual AB is, is the matrix 5, 6, 7, 8. So we run the algorithm again. So this time we set R equals 1 and 0. And then we compute the vector P and we get minus 1 and minus 1 and thereby proving AB is not equal to C. So for all possible four combinations of R, these are the resulting P vectors we get. And we could see here that around half the combinations give us zero vector result. So we then ask the question, what's the probability of randomly choosing either of these in two trials and concluding falsely that AB equals to C, so which is 1 half times 1 half which is equal to 1 by 4. So we could repeat this for more number of trials and, and each time the probability of falsely concluding it decreases exponentially with the number of trials. So for K trials we would eventually end up with the probability of falsely choosing uh, as 1 over 2 to the power of k. So now we've been asking this question all along. Uh, how often is Freewell's algorithm wrong? Because we said it's not always correct. So we would want to mathematically formulate how often is Freewell's algorithm wrong? Well, it depends on whether AB is in fact equal to C or if AB is not equal to C. So to discuss these cases we, we're going to walk through some math to figure out the probability of error and let's look at case 1. AB is equal to C and we want to verify if in fact AB is equal to C or not using the algorithm. And for any value of r vector we choose, a, b, r minus c, r is always going to return a zero, a zero vector. And so the probability that we get a non-zero vector is going to be zero. Or in other words, we could say that free will's algorithm is always correct when a, b equals to c. Now let's look at the next case where AB is not equal to C and we want to verify uh, if AB equals to C or not. So what does error mean here in this case? Well, an error would mean 
that we got a zero vector for p when in fact we should have got a non-zero vector. And so this is the probability we want to find out. And so we asked the question, what is the maximum probability that p would be a zero vector when a times p is not equal to c? So we introduce a new matrix D just for the sake of analysis and D is also an n by n matrix and this is how we define D. So P vector equals D times R vector which finally gives us uh, P1, P2 till Pn where your D vector is equals A times B minus C that is equal to uh, dij. So dij is just a representation for the entire d matrix. So now we have a times p not equal to c which means there is some element in d that is non-zero. Suppose the dij is not equal to zero. Now the corresponding pi value in p vector could be computed as sum of uh, over k to 1, k is equal to 1 to n dik times rk. So dik here represents all the elements in the ith row of the d matrix and this is the expression we get when we expand the summation and what we want to do here is we want to we isolate this dij rj and so we combine all the other terms from di1 to din and just call it as y. And so y is going to be some constant and y could be either 0 or non-zero. And then we ask the question, what's the probability for pi or in other words each of the elements of p vector to be 0. And so we use Bayes theorem to partition over y and uh, we could express the probability that pr of pi equals to 0 as the probability that pi equals to 0 given y equal to 0 times the probability of y being 0 plus the probability of pi equals to 0 given y not equal to 0 times the probability y not equal to 0. So we're going to compute this term and this term first and what we are trying to find out here is the probability that pi equals to 0 when y equals to 0 and the only way pi could become 0 when y is 0 is when rj is 0 and so this simplifies to the probability that rj equals to 0 which is 1 over 2 because rj could take only values 0 and 1 and the probability for either of them is 1 over 2. Now to calculate the second term where pi equals to 0 when y is not equal to 0. So when y is not 0 the only way that this entire expression could become 0 is when rj is 1 and dij equals minus y. And so in effect we get minus y plus y equals to 0. So this simplifies to this term and this is much lesser than the probability that rj equals to 1 is equal to 1 over 2. So we plug in these values and finally the maximum probability which we get is 1 over 2. Now this is for a single element in the p vector. So if we want to extend it to the whole p vector, we get uh, this expression where we plug in each of these values and it turns out it is much lesser than the probability that each of these elements is equal to 0 which in turn is less than 1 by 2. Now um, we want to conclude this video with the following point. So in general, if we run the algorithm for k iterations, the error rate reduces to 1 by 2 over k, 
which is an extremely small value for a large enough k. And we could see that this runs in order of k n squared time, which is much faster than deterministic method. Another interesting point of mention is the contrast to randomized quicksort. Now, randomized quicksort, even though it has an element of randomization, it is no faster than merge sort, which runs in O of n log n. So randomized quicksort, even though it's always correct, but runs slow. Whereas free will's algorithm is always fast, yet with a low error rate. This concludes our video about free will's algorithm, where we saw how introducing randomness helps achieve a faster runtime with a low error rate.